Howdy everyone, thank you for joining us. My name is Carl Carpenter with Arrakis Consulting. Uh, today we're going to talk about administrative controls and uh, their importance, what they do, and, and so on and so forth. Um, can't really say it's going to be a high level topic uh, or an in the weeds topic, but uh, we'll get into a little bit of detail. Um, and it's important to understand that administrative controls are the foundation of, of everything in relation to cybersecurity, IT, or even business in general. It's just kind of the, kind of the way it is. So starting off with uh, administrative controls, we have a few things that we you know, need to care about. Um, the first one is, is really going to be policies. And that uh, policies, what we mean by that is thou shalt do something. So for example, a good, I'm going to use encryption a lot in, in, this, uh, in this video. Um, the, uh, you should have a policy, especially if you're dealing with sensitive information, you should have a policy that says the company will use encryption. And it can be somewhat vague uh, in relation to how it's worded. We don't have to get in too great of a detail, but we need to have a policy that says the company will do encryption. And the reason why we want to do that is we need to have some sort of foundational documented material. So once we actually implement encryption, we have something that says we implemented encryption per the encryption policy and the encryption policy says this. It's also uh, super important to understand that if you're doing something and you don't have policies in place, then that could look like uh, an out of control environment within a company. And needless to say, we do run across multiple situations where clients have um, s equipment or technology or whatever in place, but they don't have the policy to support why they put it there in the first place. So uh, going back to the encryption, let's say you're in a HIPAA environment or a PCI environment or some other regulated environment that requires uh, encryption you should have a policy that says per HIPAA paragraph 12 sentence 9 we must have uh, you know encryption in place in order to be com uh, in compliant with with HIPAA and the reason you want to refer back to your authoritative source that is making you do this is because you want to be able to say uh, or demonstrate to anybody who's asking that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing so that, because of that, a policy and the way it's written and, and how it's uh, connected to the authority of source, a policy can be a shield to protect your company from, from possibly uh, investigations or people who want you to do something you're not supposed to be doing, things like that. But because of policies, it can also be what we call a sword. So we say policies are a sword and a shield at the same time. So by having a good policy, you can use that policy to enforce what you're legally obligated uh, to do. And there are a foundational set of policies that we recommend uh, everybody have in order to, to avoid situations that are less than ideal in relation to regulatory environments or law enforcement or investigators or attorneys or lawsuits or things like that. And I'll go over those at, you know, closer to the end. Uh, but generally you want to have a, around 18 or 20 policies that, you know, deal with cybersecurity, you know, and privacy and, and so on. So in relation to this example, policies, thou shalt do something. The something is going to be encryption. Thou shalt have encryption. All right, but we haven't necessarily defined what level of encryption we're going to have. So, if, for example, if we say thou shalt have encryption and then we have a standard which refers to the policy and we say the encryption is going to be triple DES, so that, that would not be good because I think, if I remember correctly, triple DES was like deprecated in like 1978 or something. So... If we had a policy that said, thou shalt have encryption, but then we did not have a standard that defined exactly what level of encryption we had, and somebody was using triple DES, which would not be good, then legally, 
they're they're in the they're in the right. They they used encryption because you know you told them to, but they didn't. You didn't say what kind of encryption, what level of encryption. So they used just used whatever was easy for them. So a standard is a document that states what level of encryption you'll have um, in this particular case. So uh, the the correct answer as of this recording is AES two fifty six. Just in case anybody's curious. Uh, for for encryption at rest and TLS 1.2 for encryption in transit. So we have that. So policies, thou shalt do something. In this case, we're talking about encryption. Standards, the something will be to this level. So I mentioned AES 256. And then we have procedures. So that's how you do the something. So the policy says you'll have encryption. Standard says it's going to be AES 256. Well, how are you going to encrypt something to meet that and generally a procedure is a detailed document in such a way where you know you're showing uh, click on file then go down to encrypt then pick AES 256 then press OK so procedures are much more detailed than than policies or, or standards now you may ask can't I just put all of this in one document technically you could but you don't want to because procedures are policies are are created and managed at a much higher level than the people who are going to be creating and implementing procedures you don't want your lower level land tech guy who's going to actually do the encryption be the deciding factor on how a policy is going to be written so that's that's pretty much the reason why additionally policies must be reviewed at least on an annual basis, which requires somebody to sign off on it. Uh, you know, it's in a ticketing system like JIRA or whatever. So you, you want to have that uh, in place. Procedures don't necessarily have to be uh, updated all the time. They, they should be reviewed, but, you know, it's kind of hit or miss sometimes. You don't want to create a situation where you get some sort of new technology uh, in relation to uh, a procedure that requires a, a meeting and an agreement on a policy change and everything else. So if you can separate out policy standards and procedures to three different documents, then it, it literally just makes it easier and more cost effective to have to deal with that. Now, in a lot of cases, uh, we'll see policies and standards blended together. And that's that's kind of OK in a lot of cases because you're you're most likely not going to be changing the level of standard for an encryption, for example, um, you know, to align with a policy. So if you had to combine things, uh, uh, combining a policy and a standard together would be fine, uh, but you absolutely don't want to combine policy standards procedures in, into one document. We, and so in our experience, we find that in relation to cybersecurity and privacy, there should be about 18 policies but in relation to procedures, if a company actually does it and does it right, uh, and based on the size of the company and uh, the complexity of the company, you could be looking at, it at about 800, or 800, 80 to 100 procedures um, that would have to be created. And again, you want to create these procedures in such a way that Anybody, so if the IT guy dies or wins the lottery or just decides not to come to work anymore, these procedures should be written that anybody in the company could pick it up and know exactly, you know, what they're, what they're going to do. Now, here's a caveat in relation to audits. So most regulatory environments says or say you must have an encryption policy. And again, I'm just picking on encryption for right now that's that's a regulatory requirement and they they say you must have you know some other things what not a single regulatory environment says is that it has to be a good policy so for example every regulatory environment says you must have antivirus but no regulatory environment says you must have a good antivirus so technically you could get away with something free and you'd have antivirus and you'd be compliant in relation to antivirus. There, there's issues, other issues with that, but technically that's that could be possible. 
So if you're concerned for your client or your company about policies, how they're written, uh, standards and procedures, that's a great concern to have. So to help you on that, policies and standards should be written more in the, the legal, from the legal mindset. Uh, procedures should be written into the, into the technical mindset, like how are you actually going to do something, All right? So another way of looking at it is policies are equivalent to, you know, a law, you know, how it all, how it all ties together. You know, uh, policies are the law. You will not break the speed limit, but policies don't state what the speed limit is. So standards, that's the, the speed limit sign uh, itself you know, the speed limit sign that you can't go faster than 55 unless you're Sammy Hagar, then, um, you know, that's, that would be the standard, but, and then how you demonstrate not going faster than the, the speed limit is, you know, would be your personal driving style, driving style. So there are some expected policies. I did say we, you know, get into that. So I'll talk about them briefly, not in great detail. Um, Arrakis uh, Consulting, we do offer policy review, policy creation, and so on and so forth. Um, and our policies are specifically designed to pass audits and in investigations and, and so on. Generally, our policies based on the company is they're about 95, 98% accurate um, in most com uh, companies. There's, there is some you know, minor tweaking that we have to do, but it is it is what it is. All right, so expected policies that, that we expect all companies to see and as an auditor, we expect you know that. First one is the information security policy. This is the foundational policy that every other policy depends upon. If you don't have the foundational policy that authorizes an information security program, things like that, then realistically anything else you write could be debated by lawyers or auditors or investigators. So you want to have the very first policy that's created should be the information security policy. Uh, there's also the acceptable use policy. That's pretty simple. You're not allowed to serve porn at work. You can't gamble on a computer that belongs to the company, you know, things like that. Um, the acceptable use policy, Again, there's a lot of loopholes from regulatory environments. You could write an acceptable use policy that says you are allowed to surf porn at work. What if you're an adult entertainment uh, company and, and you're saying, telling people they can't surf porn, but the company is based around adult entertainment? Of course, you would expect, you know, porn to be surfed. Same thing with gambling. If you're if you work for a gambling company and they say you can't surf any gambling sites, that kind of defeats the purpose of the company. So the acceptable use policy is really something that is, should be aligned to the company based on the company culture, the company ethics, and, and so on, in order to you know, protect the company, but also written in such a way that it's, if, if there had to be some sort of uh, you know, employment action, negative employment action against a, a person within the company, that it's, it's possible to, to support the, that negative employment action. Uh, privacy, privacy policy, pretty obvious. Don't tell people stuff that doesn't, you know, concern you, things like that. In the areas of like GDPR, HIPAA, CCPA, FERPA, COPPA, all that good stuff, um, privacy is super important. Uh, if, you, if you're in any one of those regulated private en environments and you don't have a privacy policy, you will be in a lot of trouble. Um, you don't want to, you don't want to do that. Uh, obviously, there's an encryption policy. We already talked about that. A backup policy. Backup policy is something you should have. Whether you back up very much or, or maybe you do real-time backups all the time, that's awesome. Uh, but you need to have some sort of backup policy and refer back to um, the underlying you know, authoritative source that says you have to have that. And in a backup policy, obviously, you want to say, we will restore every once in a while. To, we'll do a test restore. So a lot of things to, to be, you know, dealing with backup. A data destruction or media destruction policy. If, if you're holding sensitive data, then you don't want to hold data longer than you have to or legally required to. You want to get rid of it as fast as you can. 
the longer you have data that doesn't belong to do belong to you the more you're obligated to protect it so super important to have a policy that you know says you're only going to keep data as long as you have to but you're also going to destroy it in such a way that it's irretrievable uh, flaw or vulnerability remediation th that could be anything viruses patching misconfigured stuff whatever but you do want to have a policy that says you're going to fix whatever problems you come up with uh, risk management uh, there is a we have a video on risk uh, assessing risk in general both high level and detailed you really want to uh, have a risk management policy that details you will perform risk assessments and you will manage the risks and maybe even refer back to like the flaw remediation policy as a, an authoritative source. Uh, physical security, you're gonna lock your doors, you know, you're gonna protect your employees, you're gonna protect your clients' data, things like that. And again, a lot of this stuff boils down to what authoritative source is requiring you to do all of that. Asset management is another one. Uh, that's, that's a policy that uh, basically requires the company to keep track of the assets. Uh, laptops, strangely enough, I don't know where they evolved into this, but laptops have been known to grow legs and walk away. Um, I'm still looking for laptops that have grown legs. I don't have any pictures of laptops with legs, but strangely enough, those laptops grow legs and walk out the door um, it seems like, you know, how it happens. Um, so as a company, you really want to keep track of your assets to make sure laptops don't grow legs. We de-evolve them to make sure they're legless. But at the same time, your finance and, and so on departments, they're going to care about assets because they can depreciate that stuff. Super important. Business continuity. That's a good policy to have. Um, you want to have a business continuity policy that's going to define and support the business continuity plan on how your company is going to survive uh, some sort of issue. So COVID, for example, was a fantastic excuse for every single company on the planet to exercise and test their business continuity plan. Um, so that's, it's a good thing to have. Uh, data classification, uh, that is a requirement in a lot of regulatory environments. So for example, if you receive HIPAA data, you have to classify it appropriately. Um, if you're in the military or dealing with sensitive government data, you might see things like secret or top secret. Um, so you, you have to have stuff classified appropriately. And in some cases, it can actually be a felony if you're not doing that. Um, FYI, if you're a company that is dealing with sensitive data, uh, but it's not government related, don't use the word secret or top secret because those have federal classifications dealing with U.S. government data. Uh, confidential is probably acceptable or, you know, highly sensitive, things like that. But don't use secret or top secret because, again, there's federal implications to that. Um, another good policy is incident response. How are you going to, or not how, but a policy that says you will respond to incidents in a timely manner or, or whatever. Uh, password policy. Oh my gosh. This is one of the most basic policies that there is. It is amazing the number of people who have password policies that say six character passwords are still okay. Um, or they just don't understand passwords in general. Uh, so Password policy is sometimes can be rolled into the acceptable use policy because a, a good password could be viewed as acceptable use. Uh, sometimes I've seen it rolled into the information security policy, not all the time. Um, I prefer personally that it's a separate policy completely. It goes back to the other point. You don't want to change your policies all the time. Write them specifically in a vague manner, like thou shalt have a password uh, but if you're rolling password into acceptable use, then every time somebody, you know, makes passwords more, more, uh, more difficult, then you have to really adjust more than one area. So you don't want to do that. Uh, software development policy, that's another good one, but that really only applies to companies that develop software. Um, if you're, if you don't develop software, then you don't really have to have that. Uh, change management. 
Uh, change management is when you um, need to make a change within the company that's significant. So say for example, you're getting, all, getting rid of all of your Microsoft servers and going with Linux. That would be a significant change. You want to have a policy that says we're not just going to rip out the Windows servers and stick in the Linux servers and hope everything's good. The change management policy would be more along the lines of we'll have a change management policy. The change management uh, process will include these areas like testing, a backout plan, you know, change windows, things like that. Uh, vendor management, that's a huge policy to have. Every company nowadays has some sort of uh, third-party vendor or supply chain that they have to rely on. Like who's not using Google or Azure or AWS, you know, things like that. So the vendor management side of things is basically saying that you will check on the, uh, the vendor to make sure they're a safe vendor to, you know, to do work with. Um, if, you, if you're doing business with a vendor and not understanding anything about the vendor or the risks that you could entail from doing business with the vendor, then you may be liable for it. Then you have code of conducts or corporate ethics. This is fairly simple. We're going to be nice to each other at work. However, some government contracts and some of the larger companies uh, require specific wording in code of conduct or corporate ethics. And that specific wording has to do with you will not be doing business with any embargoed country like uh, Syria or Iran or North Korea. Um, you will not use any sort of child labor. Uh, you will not be involved in the, uh, the sex trade, like uh, kidnapping women and, or you know, the slave trade or any of that stuff. Uh, you'll see that in some of your larger, larger contracts or government contracts. So in, in relation to policies on a holistic sense, I d again, I do want to point out that Arrakis Consulting, we do offer uh, policy creation, policy review, and the whole intent behind that is that we can give you the foundational material so you can uh, pass an audit, or at least the first stage of an audit, in relation to you know, your administrative controls and, and so on that auditors or investigators you know, will, will look at. So why do we care? So first off, administrative controls, they are the foundation for pretty much anything cybersecurity or, or regulatory related. Again, if you deploy technology um, and you don't have a policy to, to back up why you're deploying that technology, it could be viewed by an auditor or an investigator that you have an out of control IT environment or an out of control cybersecurity environment. So you wanna have some sort of underlying authoritative, internal authoritative source that says, it's okay for me to deploy an IDS IPS because this policy says I have to, and this policy is referring to HIPAA article 59 or whatever. Actually, I think I blended HIPAA and GDPR together just now. But... All right, uh, another good reason is it's always the first step in the assessment or in an assessment or an audit. Um, if you ask a third party to come in to look at your you know, corporate security or things like that, the very first thing they're gonna do is give me all of your policy standards and procedures so I can review those. And if you have, uh, it, unfortunately we've run across uh, situations where, uh, I literally have run across situations where there's a medical company just three years ago, they still had triple DES as an acceptable uh, encryption method. Um, and I, again, I think triple DES I think it was deprecated in like 1978 or something. So it's, it's, it's some crazy outdated encryption technology. So the, in that particular case, were they compliant with the company policy? Yes, they were encrypting, but not with what they were legally obligated to. So then in that case, who gets in trouble? The person who did the encryption and followed company policy? Or is it the company because they didn't say what they were supposed to do? It'd be the company. All right, so it's always going to be the first step in, in everything that goes on for an assessment or an audit. Policies will also be reviewed if there's some sort of breach or an investigation. 
So if you have a problem and uh, the FBI or law enforcement or some sort of you know, court ordered third party comes in to look at your company to see how secure you are, they will be looking at your policy standards and procedures, your ticketing system, your logs, things like that. And they're gonna make sure that you have appropriate wording in those documents. And if you don't, you could be facing some serious sanctions. Uh, another area in relation to an investigation or just a complaint uh, would be the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC. Um, if, there's a, if there's a complaint, they can launch their own investigation independent of any sort of breach or FBI involvement or, any, or court ordered stuff, anything like that. And this will be one of the things that they, uh, that they look at. So I realize that uh, administrative controls, policy standards, procedures is extremely exciting. I hope I didn't, uh, you know, just get anybody so excited that they, you know, don't know what to do now. Uh, but the reality of it is, is regardless of how exciting it is, uh, it is something that has to be done. And again, if you have issues with uh, policy standards or procedures and you need some help, feel free to reach out to us. It's sales at arrakisconsulting.com. And we absolutely won't hold it against you if you sign up for our YouTube channel or LinkedIn or Facebook or anything else we have. Um, it's, you know, certainly would appreciate that. And with that, everyone, thank you very much. I will talk to you later. See ya.